Wille stark klar. Kaffee in der Hand. Alles gut. Um, is there anyone English speaking or should be? All right, perfect. Because I really don't like to, uh, to present in German, so that's fine for me. <laughs> All right, my uh, name is Tim Messerschmidt. I'm a developer evangelist at PayPal, and today I'm going to present you a talk called Innovation in Mobile Payments. <clears throat> there will be basically two topics I will be covering. One is uh, secure identification and authorization in the internet. And the second topic I will be covering is mobile payments. So hopefully it's interesting for you guys. Um, if you have any questions during the whole talk, if you feel like I'm talking too fast, too slow, you want to ask anything, just uh, feel free to interrupt me. I will be happy to answer if I can. All right, so who am I? I'm a passionate developer, mobile and web developer, and I'm a huge Android and Twitter fanboy. So if you want to reach me, just contact me on Twitter. My contact details will be on the last slide. And what will I be talking about? So the agenda basically is um, the question, what is PayPal access? I will uh, mainly focus on the underlying techniques. So I will be talking about OAuth, I will be talking about OpenID Connect, and how these things fit together. Then I'm going to cover the question how to accept payments. It's like a really fast integration, and I will be covering how you add the library to your project and how you can do it all. And the last thing I will be doing is a tiny outlook um, titled Innovation which will be basically about real-world payments, like offline payments, and how you can think of them. In case anyone wants my slides, you can scan the QR code, enter the short URL, or just check out our slide share channel. So, um, you should be fine. Anyone wants to scan it? Oh yeah, over there. Do you feel like I'm too silent and I can speak up, or is it fine? Lots of iPhones here. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. Did you want to scan it? All right. So, what is PayPal Access? PayPal Access basically is a tool that enables you to uh, use existing PayPal accounts and use them to log in into uh, a web service, into an application, into anything which basically could need user accounts. <coughs> this technique got introduced in 2011 at our annual event called Innovate. It's a big conference over in San Francisco. And uh, basically what we wanted to achieve is that um, all those user accounts which are out there can be leveraged to push your own service. So as mentioned before, users can log in with their existing PayPal credentials, which basically means they don't have to register at your service again and again and again because I guess everyone agrees logging in at a service sucks, especially if you have to register before. So if I have to put a picture into this, it's like 170 million potential new users just by adding PayPal access to your service. It's just a few lines of code and you can enable anyone to log in. As mentioned, you leverage existing technology to push your own service. This is what I really love to talk about, since um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to create big user databases. You don't have to think of how to, identifying, uh, how to identify the user, because this all is already managed. This is one of the big advantages of single sign-on. So users have their existing credentials, like maybe their Twitter login. And they can use their Twitter login or their Facebook login to go to SlideShare, to go to SoundCloud, all those new cool tech startup things. And you can do the same with uh, this one. But we have some advantages I will be covering in a few minutes. As mentioned, this one is based on OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Who has ever been playing with Open, uh, OpenID Connect or OAuth? Nice, that's good. It's very important to mention, it's not related to payments. 
this one is just for identifying purposes. And uh, I will be talking about why. Because mainly people don't want to log in with PayPal if they think, oh my god, they will take some money from me and I cannot know how much it is and when it will be uh, taken from my account. So this one clearly states, if they log in, that there is no financial transaction involved. It is free to use both for the user and the developer, which is very important since uh, you might think that we have transaction fees and those things involved. And you can register your applications over at x.com, which is our developer portal. Um, you can find all the uh, developer resources from eBay Incorporated over there. So if you look to um, find the documentations, if you want to have sample code, anything, just go to x.com and check out the documentations. You can find all the interesting links over there or in these slides. So basically, um, the registration form will uh, be looking something like this. You have to define the return URL because this technique is using callbacks and you can define which attributes you want to have from the user. As soon as the user is going to log in, he can see which attributes you want and can decline or um, uh, allow the, the usage. So basically, it's not like logging in with Facebook and you're not really sure what is going on with your data. This is really uh, nice because users want to know what you do. If you have the address, they should know it, right? And you can choose between OAuth2 and OpenID Connect or the general OpenID flow. So it's very important to understand that OpenID and <coughs> OpenID Connect is not the same technique. Uh, to be honest, um, OpenID Connect even bases on OAuth2 because it uses the authorization and so um, the old, uh, old stuff from OpenID is gladly gone. There will be additional features coming soon, like um, if a user already shows to log in with PayPal, he should be uh, enabled to do payments much easier than he is now, right? So. How does this look like? I'm going to cover one example in the slides and then I'm going to show you a live education. Um, this service is mainly uh, public in America yet, but we are pushing this into Europe because we think it's very cool. So this one is an example my colleague Jonathan did. It's a wonderful pet store. And uh, there are some things where you don't want to register your account because you only buy stuff really rare, like twice a year, and you don't want to have an account, and you know that you're not going to remember your credentials over there. So you choose to log in with PayPal. Then you're going to be uh, presented a login form where you enter your credentials, like your email address and your PayPal password. And if you choose to log in, you see which data is getting shared. So in this case, it's my name, it's my email address, and if I'm a verified user or not. The last one is very important, and I'm going to explain why. Because nowadays, people tend to register at different services, trash mail services, everything, and what they do is they provide you any crappy email they can just take in a few minutes. Because maybe they don't want that you have uh, their email address, maybe they are too lazy to enter it again. And uh, if you use access, you get valid data because uh, we as a bank need valid data from the user. So how does this one work? I've mentioned uh, topics like OAuth, OpenID and OpenID Connect and basically um, these techniques OAuth and OpenID are different because one is about authorization in the internet and one is about identification in the internet. So basically, if you use OpenID, you want to uh, you want to prove that it's really you who is going to log in. So if I choose to log in with OpenID at some service, I want to prove that Tim Messerschmidt really wants to use the service. But at OAuth, it's basically the idea. I want to be anonymous, but I want to be able to use resources like my pictures, like my Twitter stream, whatever, in this service without 
having to uh, provide all my data. So this one shouldn't be mi mi mixed up. O of 1 uh, is really clunky. Who had ever to work with O of 1 in an application? So you know it's really a mess. <laughs> it got introduced in April 2007 and basically they never continued any work so you can imagine like how fast we web developed and applications came into this thing and nobody really thought about authentication for mobile phones and those things so the technique is really old. It is as mentioned clunky to implement so you had to add lots of HTTP headers you had to add uh, encryption and lots of things which basically make it really hard to just authenticate. This one is being uh, introduced by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. So it's a known standard. And it's really interesting to know. Um, OAuth and OpenID use uh, something called token. And these tokens get passed from the server to uh, the client and from the client to the server to authorize requests. And tokens here never expired. So basically only if the user decided to uh, revoke access, the uh, token wasn't valid anymore. OAuth 2 is uh, co currently considered as a stable draft, but lots of companies really don't choose to upgrade their implementation. So companies like Facebook already have OAuth 2 in some kind of beta standard thing, but they don't upgrade because it's working and they don't care. Um, there's a big focus on performance and scalability. So um, while OF1 was really old and you had to add lots of stuff and the client had to do lots of stuff and nobody really knew how to use this, OF2 is very lean. So um, they rely on HTTPS as a security element. So you don't have to, uh, have to add lots of stuff on top to it. And it supports different authorization scenarios. So, in case you want to have a mobile application, the flow would be different to a web application or to a desktop application. And it's very important to know, the tokens here are very short-lived. So, while OAuth 1 had tokens which could be valid forever, at OAuth 2 the tokens shouldn't be uh, valid for more than like one day, two days, maybe a week, but it's not forever. If you have read tech blogs in the last few weeks, and months, maybe Hacker News or something different, you might have uh, seen that there are different opinions on OAuth 2. There was a really uh, interesting blog article called OAuth 2 and the Road to Hell. And basically this guy, Aaron Hammer, who was one of the uh, authors of OAuth 2, said this is a fully blown standard and it is really bad. He said, OAuth 2 offers little to none code reusability and uh, basically nobody should use it. Furthermore, he added what 2.0 offers is a blueprint for an authorization protocol. So he says, if you have ever implemented anything, you had to add so much stuff on top for it to be working that it's not just easy to use it and uh, it's a huge mess. Tim Bray, various, um, one of the Google advocates, said um, that OAuth 2 is already used for today. And this one is a very long quote, but basically it says it's working. So, OpenID Connect, as I mentioned, it isn't based on OpenID any, uh, like anyhow, but it adds uh, some nice features to OAuth 2. So, OAuth 2 is used to authorized users and uh, OpenID Connect adds some really good features like session management. So you basically cannot just log in, you can log out, you can check if the token is still valid and uh, some other stuff which is really cool. You um, sh uh, choose to have different scopes that you want to access and in our case it's profile, email, address, phone and attributes. And attributes is very interesting since you can have details like when did this uh, user register at PayPal, is he verified, what is, uh, what is his date of birth and all those things which you can use for your application to uh, customize the experience. 
So if I have to uh, summarize the difference between OAuth and OpenID Connect, it's basically one just grants access to resources and there are lots of pitfalls. So especially if you want to allow users to use data and all those things, um, OAuth on the server side is quite bad. But if you use OAuth only for authorization and you add the OpenID stack, it's quite easy. And Gladly, for applications, it's very uh, very easy to switch between OAuth and OpenID since you only have to change some URLs and you can add the session management. So you might wonder, why should anyone use this? Why should anyone use OAuth or OpenID Connect to uh, register your application or to log in? There, yeah, I have two facts for you. One is people forget passwords. It's true because I do it all the time. And then it must be true. <laughs> so 45% of uh, people admit to leaving a website because if they forgot a password and they have to enter a security question and they maybe don't remember because it's like, what was your, uh, uh, your mom's birthplace? What was your first dog's name? All those things. Maybe you don't even remember or you don't want to enter it and they just leave and they take another service, another application, anything. So uh, you lose a potential user. Furthermore, 66% of the surveyed users said that they prefer single sign-on since if they already have an existing account which has all the data they want to have, why should they enter it into your service? Especially if you are on the go, you use a mobile application, a mobile web service, and you have to enter your, I don't know, like your address, you have to enter your zip code, you have to add your full name, last name, middle name, your dog's name, all those things. You don't want to do it all the time again and again. Because nowadays input fields in applications can be modified. So if you have to enter a number, it shows the number field and all those things. But still, it's so easy to make errors, even if you want to input the correct data, that you should think about implementing single sign-on. So, if I have to talk about the value of this technique, in our case, it's verified user accounts, which is real value for you, because you know <coughs> that the users you uh, address are not some creepy fake accounts, and uh, this enables you to um, provide more serious use cases because if you want to really sell something, if you have a pizza application and you want to know the address without, the user, uh, without asking the user to enter it, this one could be cool. If you want to have something with real data, you want to customize the user experience, this is really neat because if you use uh, services like Twitter, you get uh, a, a reply with a location and the location could be something like Germany in my case and you cannot use that at all. So if I have to show you an existing profile, this one is from our documentations and what you can see is that there's an address, the email, some other stuff like the language code and you can use this data which is basically quite nice. There's the time zone in it, the gender, so if you want to have a pink and a blue application for males and females, you can use this. Um, it's quite cool. And uh, furthermore, we add some tokens which you can use for identification in databases. I'm going to show that in a second. So, is anybody here who knows the OR flow? One, <laughs> two, three? All right, so I'm going to show it like really fast. There are two sides, the client and the server. The client is basically your application and the server is provided by us in this case. So if the client opens the authorization endpoint URL, which is a quite long name for just login page, uh, the server provides this page and if the user chooses to log in, an authorization token gets returned to the uh, client. So the uh, client is waiting while the user is logging in and he checks for callbacks and as soon as the callback is being called he extracts the authorization token parameter and sends it again to the server. 
because he wants to access a valid, uh, he wants to have a valid access token. So the server takes this uh, authorization token he just got, he checks if it's valid, and if it's valid, he returns an access token, which can be used to retrieve user resources. So if I have to summarize, you have a few components. In this case, it's the auth implementation. You have the authorization URL, you have the token service URL, and you have the profile URL you want to uh, retrieve. And of course, you have client details, which are uh, the client ID and the client secret, which are being used to identify your application at the server. So if you only want to request the user's name and his email, you only get those data instead of everything because another application requested everything. Anyone Android developer? Alright, because this one will be covering Android, but um, it's like the same in every language. So, you load the authorization URL in a web view, or you can just pass it to the Android browser and check for callbacks with intents. So, checking URLs are quite easy because there is a method should override URL loading, and what you can do is check every URL your web view is loading if your callback URL is included, and if it's the case, you can just process it. So, this one is some messy code, <laughs> and basically what it does is, it takes the access to, uh, the authorization token, uses it, uh, uses it for the token service, does another post, and uh, after that it can retrieve uh, a user profile by using the access token it just got. So this one is an asynchronous call, and basically um, the execute gets executed first, and after that, this is the result. But you can do it like you want, it's just my code. So what you get back from the server is a reply with three different tokens. And they all have uh, different uh, timelines. So basically, the access token is something not too long, and it can be used to retrieve uh, user resources. Then there is the token type, which is always Bira. Then there is a refresh token, which can be used for OpenID to refresh your access token. So if you know uh, that your access token is not valid anymore, you can refresh it. The access token at PayPal is valid for 15 minutes, and the refresh token is valid for 8 hours. The ID token at the button can be used to identify your user. So uh, this one could be useful for you. So if I have to conclude about PayPal access, it can be used to enhancing your application because you can add a verified user base. Is there any question for access right now? No? Good. So let's do it. Yeah? So, um Besides the, the verified status of the user, what is the main advantage over, let's say, Facebook login or Twitter or, I don't know, GitHub? It uses the same stuff, so basically um, the big advantage is very, like, the verified user is the big advantage because it is being proof. Um, I, I think the main advantage is there is an address which should be correct for the payment if you want to send something to the user. Right, so if you want to do real world transactions, you, never enter your home address, for example. you can just enter anything because it's never being proved. And yeah. as said before, this is just one big advantage, but the advantage is really huge. Mm -hmm. But aren't users um, suspicious if they are forced to, to enter their PayPal credentials on, on some site? So I can show you how this login looks like. Hopefully, I can. <laughs> oh. So this is our developer portal, and if you choose to log in, you have two different options. And if I choose to log in with PayPal, hopefully something is happening. Yeah. You see, at the very top, that we don't want to include financial stuff. So if you see that there is PayPal as a login option, and this one says, 
All right, we don't do any processing of money. You should be fine, right? I mean, of course we could lie, but we don't. <laughs> Promised. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, back to these slides, I guess. Any more questions to access? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but I have a question. Um, isn't um, for the refreshment token, isn't eight hours a very long time? A very relevant time? I mean, uh, what you do is because you have a, uh, session management stuff and those things, an access token should be quite short because you want to retrieve uh, data once. And if you feel like you want to have refreshed user data, this refresh token uh, doesn't just, um, I mean, you have to pass this refresh token and an ID token to the server. And what you want to enable the user is he doesn't have to log in again after a few hours. So eight hours isn't too long, but it's not too, too short because it's only being used for refreshing an access token, which is valid for 50 minutes again. And you, have, you get a new refresh token, so basically, you just have the possibility of um, having an easier experience for your user. Yeah, but uh, I could have solved for a couple of questions um, about the man in the middle attack or something like this. Doesn't make uh, eight hours, is, is in my opinion, for security concerns, a very long time. I mean, a man in the middle attack shouldn't be hopefully an issue because it's uh, using HTTPS and all those things. And right. so. If you manage to uh, use our certificate in our, any way, it's already an issue if you want to have the access token, right? Uh, so um, I guess that's a problem with, like, that would be a problem with the whole uh, OAuth and OpenID stuff. If you choose to reuse this, but um, since it's been uh, it's using um, encryption by using HTTPS <coughs> and all those things, it should be fine. As, as uh, secure as HTTPS is. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so. Thank you. Another question on board. Oh. You can answer that, the first one. Take a look at can the user control this data is actually sent to the requesting service? For example, if I don't want to share with request data. So basically, uh, it's an all in. I see which data is uh, being shared. And I can choose to allow this, or I can deny. But sadly, right now there's no checkbox where I can say username is fine, birth date is bad, gender is fine, those things. Sadly, are not there yet, but we might think of it. Like, if there's any user feedback and users I mean, demand is it. Is it actually possible with OAuth? I don't think so. Um, it's OpenID in this case. And uh, I mean, OAuth just uh, says how you share the stuff but not the what, because um, that's the difference between uh, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. And OpenID Connect uh, allows you to add a stack on top of this to um, access different resources. Like, OAuth usually just provides any resources you can get, because it doesn't really know what you want. And in OpenID Connect, you could have different scopes, and uh, because, of, because of that, you can even have uh, different requests, so it, it should be fine that a user selects, I want to uh, share my birth date, but not my name. Uh, but actually this, this also happens with Facebook Connect, as far as I remember. You can give a scope, mm -hmm. and then you can retrieve all this data. That's an implementation of them. Okay. So um, that's the server side, so you can choose to do it like you want. Okay. All right. <laughs> So about payments, we have two ways of uh, doing payments in applications and web services. So for applications, there is a native SDK, which I will be covering in a few seconds, and there's a Webflow. Webflow basically is quite easy since we have lots of sample code for Java, PHP, Python, everything. And what you do is you have free URLs, you use them, and you say, I want to do this payment. Then the user logs in, accepts, so you get a callback. You can verify that the payment is fine, and then you can do the transaction. 
And the native one is really cool since you can have different payment scenarios. So the native uh, library is called Mobile Payments Library, short MPL. And what you do is you get the uh, library from our documentation. You add the jar to your project uh, libraries. Sorry, again, Android. <laughs> um, you add some permissions to your application. You need, of course, uh, internet because it has to communicate with our servers. Wi-Fi state for security reasons and read phone state to identify the phone. You add another activity pro to your project because this all is intent-based. Um, so your application says, I want to pay. Uh, it's sending an intent, which is basically a message from, an, from one view to another. And um, then you are going to initialize the payment. So you need some kind of PayPal object. You can use this by, uh, from the library. You have to initialize it with your app ID. And you can choose different uh, environments. There's the live environment, a sandbox, and a demo mode, which basically accepts everything you enter. Then you're going to add a PayPal button to your uh, existing layout, which is being computed, so you can provide a text like donate, pay, whatever you want. And um, you can choose between different sizes. Then you have to add a one -click, uh, an on-click listener, so basically, if a user uh, tips on this button, something has to happen. And you add it to your view. And this thing is the uh, magic stuff. So you initialize the payment, you set a currency, who is going to receive this uh, payment, and how much do you want to pay. Then you just um, start with intent, and that's it. So this one. It's a simple payment between one user that is going to pay and one receiver. But what you can do with this library is a chain payment. So there, are, there is a first receiver and there are many receivers after this. So you can split a payment between up to six different users after that. And you can do stuff like a parallel payment, which is basically the split payment, but directly. And what you get is, if the user accepts the payment, is a result OK code. And you can do anything with it, or um, you get a cancelled if the user shows that the 60 euros for his pizza is too, um, too much. And that's basically it. So the conclusion about payments would be, it mustn't be complicated, right? Because you're a developer <coughs> and you don't want to think about payments all the time, what's the best integration way, and how can you communicate with an internet gateway to process payments. So this one uh, takes much of the stress, and um, it's so easy. Is there any question about payments? Um, are there any plans to provide an NDK-based uh, solution for Android? Is Why should it be NDK? Uh, just out of curiosity? All right. So, um, I, the, the most uh, problem I have is when I have to use some old application, the sample code to the library, the Facebook or Twitter provides almost always Java and other crappy languages, which I cannot use in <laughs> C++ world. Well. Right. Um, so, what you can do is you could use a Webflow and embed it in your application with some kind of web view. So, uh, you could take all the work you would do on the client side, do it in a web view and just um, show it somehow. I don't know if you, how you can do it with a web view and the NDK, but somehow you should be able to display yeah, web pages. It would be easy solution if uh, Paper, for example, provided a static library where the core functionality is inside, like authorization and authorization. Sure. So you can build your own, um, let's say, your own user interface in 3D world without using any. Sadly, we don't have that right now, but we're thinking of something uh, for next year. So, might be interesting for you, but I may not. <laughs> so, yeah. Because I'm an open source developer from the OVC project, and I'm also ported the engine for Android, and I'm just using 
same clip because maybe for our customers sure. we just use C++ because it's a tool across platform. I mean, what you still could do is you could use the existing usual APIs and you could call them. So you have to provide some kind of mechanism to um, let the user log in and the PayPal provider page. But the other stuff, you can just like, we don't care if it's a server or an application, right? So you could use C++ code to do all the API stuff. Because um, what this native library, it's like Java library or for uh, iOS Objective-C library does is using an API, so it's a wrapper. So you could use the same APIs which are uh, documented to process your payment too, in case you want to do something different, like really native C++ style. Because I mean, this use case really might make sense so that you have the same code base for both platforms and you don't have to pay, take care of payments for each of them. Is there any uh, other questions regarding payments? No? Well, maybe. Um, I'm, at a bit, I'm not too much into this payments world, but um, there are other um, solutions as well. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, in Austria there's M MP24 and there's Wirecard and something. Yeah. Uh, and there are always service level agreements with those guys. <coughs> are there any uh, kind of service level agreements with PayPal? Do we have? If I, I mean, if I want to use PayPal in an enterprise environment, yeah, I want to have some kind of service delivery. Sure. Uh, so, what does PayPal offer in this case? I mean, um, there are payment service providers like Wirecard, yeah. which uh, implement different services. So it would be something like credit cards, PayPal, all those things. So you could they have libraries you could use, and uh, of course. I mean, what do you mean with service uh, level agreements? So, I mean, I mean um, it's just a while ago that I implemented some, some Wirecard implementation, but I think uh, what they have is some kind of setup fee, and then you can process oh. a thousand uh, payments a day or something. Mm -hmm. I think it's some kind of uh, something in this regard. So we have different uh, business models depending on the product. So if you have lots of microtransactions, we have a, a product called digital goods which is nice if you have like 40 cents, 50 cents, those things because the usual PayPal transaction fee would be higher. So um, you have more margin. And uh, so we try to do this by having like um, nice products for different use cases and if you have lots of uh, amounts of money flowing through your application using PayPal, there are different fees depending on your volume. So if you have like 50,000 a month, the fee would be uh, generally lower than if you have 10,000 or 2,000. So this one would be one of the services. Okay, that's actually not what I meant. I mean, uh, if, I, if I incorporate this into my enterprise business, okay? Yeah. Uh, then I want to make sure that PayPal is there for me even two months later. So is there some kind of contract that uh, provides me with um, this service for a certain amount of time? I mean, um, because you, you decide, I mean, tomorrow and say, okay, we don't want our service anymore, and you just sure. cut it, and then my business is going bankrupt. No, I, I get what you want. So, um, we are tied to the usual banking laws, so we cannot just be gone in a day, sadly. <laughs> no, and um, what we offer is depending on how big your enterprise would be, is that you get uh, account managers and all those things, and all the contracting stuff is their part. So I'm the techie guy, so if they can provide you a service level agreement, that's fine for me, but I can't, sorry. <laughs> sorry. But uh, yeah, so if you're a big company, you should come to me, drop me your email, and I can forward it to the right people. There's one question about... Oh. Uh, donations are fine. Like the first question is, is PayPal donate in-app payment compatible with Play Store in terms of service? So um, the different terms of services at the application stores are now a bit confusing, especially at Google. So they say that digital downloads should be processed uh, from by we are using the in-app payments SDK. But uh, it's not fully uh, rolled out yet, and they don't define which countries. Furthermore, what they don't do is um, they, they don't enforce it. 
So what I can say you is that um, if you use a physical stuff, like if you want to buy physical stuff, it's totally fine. But if you want to do digital stuff, you should drop a, li uh, drop a line to one of the Google advocates and to me, and we can sort this out. Regarding donations, it should be fine. But in generally, uh, on Android, you don't really have to care. But uh, on iOS, you have to do every uh, digital download thing always with Apple, since they enforce it. And the other one is... Um, the, so the user addresses are going through... So the question is, does PayPal verify the user addresses or just the credit card? So the credit card is of course being processed if you add it. So uh, that's truly uh, like totally fine. And the address is being looked up, so it's a real address. Of course, we cannot check if the user is really living there. But uh, what we can do is um, we can check if this address, this street, and the number do exist. Uh, yeah, I guess that's the questions over there. Any more questions about payment? No? So, just a short outlook about innovation. We see that real-world payments right now are very, very interesting. And um, we have a solution working in Austria and in Germany right now, which is called QR shopping. And we've been uh, doing some research and uh, some other companies as well about adoption of QR codes and those things. So what we saw is QR code adoption is different between different countries. And if you take one of the top five uh, countries that have a huge smartphone usage, you see that Germany is one of the leading countries. So it might make sense to do something with QR codes in your application if it's in Germany or in Spain. The British people don't really like QR codes. I don't know why. So there's the survey by Nielsen. It's a big market researcher, and they found out that 70% uh, of 30 million surveyed countries, uh, households uh, recognize QR codes and know how to use them. So this one is a big advantage uh, to techniques like NFC, because people already know how to use it. I think NFC is very, very interesting, but sadly right now, uh, like usual people, not just the techies, don't really know how to work with it and if it's secure or not. So our solution so looks somehow like this. There's this application QR shopping. You can find it in the App Store and uh, in the Play Store. And we have this branded QR codes, which can be used in stores. And if you scan this thing, you get like a cheaper Android tablet, whatever. And you can see it. There is like different uh, stores that use this to do stuff like. Um, like, if you go there and you want to have a really cool branding, you want to have good advertisement, this one could be used because people recognize our name and they see that it's something special, so they uh, tend to scan it and they might want to buy it. Any questions regarding QR shopping? Um, so the technique behind this is the uh, big innovation because there are different servers and databases and card warehouse systems that are uh, being used for this. So of course the QR code is no uh, innovation because QR codes do exist since some time and um, I mean they are old. So NFC is, isn't even an innovation nowadays. But the innovation is um, the ease of the uh, shopping and that this one is bringing payments, online payments, to an offline use case. So it's not the QR code itself, which is like the fantastic magic thing. I uh, truly agree. Anything more? No. So if you want to have uh, further information of, about all those things, there are two useful links I can provide. One is uh, migrating access to OpenID Connect, because I think it's much nicer than OAuth. And there is a sample project for Android. It's hosted on GitHub. 
It uses the Apache v, uh, V2 license, so you can just use it, modify it, but you have to mention that you used this thing. And it provides helper classes for using OAuth and OpenID in your application with paper access. There's an official documentation at x.com slash identity, and you can find the payment uh, documentations at, at x.com slash mobile. Um, if you have any problems with integrations, if you get uh, return values that shouldn't make, like they don't make sense at all, or something like that, we have a 24-7 uh, technical service. You can reach them at paypal.com slash DTS. So it's a ticketing service. You provide your error logs and those things, and these guys analyze why this happens. And we have developer forms. So is there any questions? So because otherwise that will be it. Questions? No? Right, so in case you want to reach me, you can just uh, hook me an email, Twitter message, pull the class, whatever you want. Thanks.